My name is Jimmy Kemp. I'm president of the Jack Kemp Foundation, and it's a pleasure to be here at the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, where they've been gracious enough to host uh, another Jack Kemp Oral History Symposium. Uh, today we'll hear about the HUD years during my father's uh, time from 1989 to 1993 uh, as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, um, and we're really grateful for uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center, which is having a housing commission currently um, that we are, the Jack Kemp Foundation is participating in. Um, and it's an incredibly important issue uh, and component for our country to achieve the dream uh, that so many of us Americans share, uh, that all people would be um, housed and have the opportunity uh, to really live what dad understood to be the American dream, to provide a place for your family uh, where they can grow and thrive. Um, it's a fundamental aspect of, of life and uh, we're looking forward to hearing the reflections that our panelists have today. Um, and right now I'd like to introduce Julie Anderson, who's uh, the Vice President of the Bipartisan Policy Center. Julie, thank you for having us. Thank you, Jimmy. I'm Julie Anderson with the Bipartisan Policy Center. Um, I want to just welcome everyone here today. As Jimmy mentioned, we are working with the Kemp Foundation, um, who is partnering with us on our Housing Commission. We launched a Housing Commission last fall. It is led by Senators George Mitchell and Kit Bond and former HUD Secretaries Mel Martinez and Henry Cisneros. Um, we are working with the Kemp Foundation to get outside the Beltway and host some forums where we can actually hear from uh, real people and stakeholders across the country about this very important issue. We're thrilled to be helping to uh, host the Oral History next installment today and are particularly happy that it's on um, Jack Kemp's HUD years. And I'm sure there's a lot of lessons we could learn from those years that are still applicable to the uh, tough decisions and issues we're facing today. So welcome everyone and um, um, we look forward to hearing about the HUD years. Thank you. Welcome to this uh, Jack Kemp Oral History Symposium uh, uh, at uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center. I'm Morton Kondracki. Uh, and I would like the participants uh, who uh, worked with Jack while he was at HUD to per first identify yourselves, um, tell us what you did at HUD, uh, or if you weren't at HUD, in, case, in uh, Dr. Woodson's case, uh, what your association with Jack was while, while he was at HUD, and uh, what was your previous association? How did you get your job at, uh, at HUD in the beginning? So starting with Scott Reed. Good morning. Uh, my name is Scott Reed. I was uh, Jack's chief of staff at the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, for three years, 89 through early 92. And prior to that, I'd worked with him when he ran for president of uh, the United States. I drew the short straw and was in charge of Iowa <laughs> and got to spend 75, 80 days with him campaigning in Iowa and that's how I developed my working relationship. Good. Uh, my name is Bob Woodson. In fact, I was a competitor with Jack for the job of HUD Secretary. As uh, John Sununu and President uh, Bush uh, interviewed me, I was vetted by the uh, background check of FBI and uh, the president in his infinite wisdom selected Jack <laughs> and from that day on I, I became uh, an unpaid advisor to Jack helping him to continue to strengthen his relationships with the end users of HUD uh, services the public housing residents uh, and people living in those communities served by HUD I'm Al Dullabovi. I served as uh, the uh, Deputy Secretary uh, of HUD under Jack Kemp. Uh, the job was basically the, the Chief Operating Officer of the Department. Uh, before that, in the Reagan administration, I served as uh, Administrator of the Urban Mass Transit Administration. And in that role, Bob Woodson and I worked uh, together to promote uh, uh, opportunity and entrepreneurship uh, uh, jobs for uh, low-income people in the transit business, and that made me somewhat attractive and known to the, the HUD constituency and certainly to, uh, uh, to Jack. I'm John Weicker. I'm an economist. I run the Hudson Institute Center for Pol uh, Housing and Financial Markets, and I was Assistant <coughs> Secretary for Policy Development and Research through the four years uh, that Secretary Kemp was at HUD. Uh, before that, uh, I was at HUD as chief economist 
when Carl Hills was the secretary in the Ford administration. And after that, I was the assistant secretary for housing and uh, federal housing commissioner in the, uh, when secretaries were Mel Martinez and Alfonso Jackson in the first term of President George W. Bush. Um, okay, uh, starting with Scott, uh, or uh, any, any of you can chime in. Ah, we're joined by Steve Goldsmith. Sorry. That's okay. Good, thank you. Mm. Morning, so, mm. Good to gentlemen, see. let you get Mike up. Nice old friends, this I feel <laughs> really excited. So your, the first question to you, uh, Steve, is um, uh, what was your connection with Jack Kemp? I mean, uh, while, while he was at HUD, before he was at HUD, after he was at HUD, um, you were mayor of Indianapolis uh, at, in 1991, but what, what was the range of your association with Jack? Uh, you want me to do that in one minute or two? <laughs> right. One so minute will do. <laughs> well, um, uh, let me see how I can summarize this. So I, f I first saw Jack when he came to do a political event in Indianapolis. I think I may have been a prosecutor. I don't know if he's running for president, what he was doing. And, you know, I had a reputation as a football player, and I went to listening, you know, and I thought of myself as a relatively well-educated guy. And I thought, God, the guy actually knows what he's talking about. He went through the supply side thing with great detail. It was very motivating, right, a lot of facts. and. And then um, eventually I became mayor. Uh, I can't remember the t chronology. And of course, for those of us, there weren't, there weren't very many Republican mayors of big cities to begin with, right? And um, to have uh, somebody of uh, uh, Jack's uh, energy and intellect advocating uh, 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 bleeding hard conservatism or whatever phrase we want to put on it for purposes of getting started was quite invigorating. And so um, uh, staying in touch with him, uh, everything he would advocate at HUD, I would try to do. Sometimes with the same results, sometimes you know with not, and and um, and and lots of experiences associated with that. Um, uh, when I would come in and out of the um, uh, Bush White House, really first um, as uh, one of the few Republican mayors, then I have opportunity to inter intersect with Jack, and then after he left. Uh, stayed as uh, friends and uh, he would, um, he knew I was, a, I remained a advocate for his policies. So when he had something particularly enthusiastic to say, he thought mayor should pay attention to, he would call and I would repeat it with equal vigor. So, uh, and, and of course knew uh, uh, Joanne as well. So I, I, just in summary, for those of us who uh, took over as mayor in the 90s, a period that followed a lot of really catastrophically bad urban policy, right? And if, we, if we, we took those jobs right because we cared about people who lived in our cities. And, and, and at that time, uh, Jack's message and the one I thought about was, was totally congruent, which is that, you know, uh, big liberal policies didn't work and ignoring folks who are poor um, didn't work either. And right, so it's the, it's the uh, you know, it's the, it's, the, it's the empowerment agenda that came together in Jack's deep respect for people and what they could become that motivated my work, and I'd have to say the work of many of the better mayors in the country during that period of time. Okay, uh, Scott, uh, w what do we know about how, or anybody, how Jack Kemp got the job? I mean, that, how, he, how he got picked. And then what did he tell <coughs> you each when he decided to, to take the job about how, why he decided to take the job? Well, after, um, after George H.W. Bush became the nominee, Kemp was a loyal supporter of Bush's, and uh, he campaigned for him some. And he was going through his own transition period at the time where he was going to be leaving Congress after a long career, and he was trying to figure out what he wanted to do with his career for the next phase of his life. <coughs> um, I was with uh, Kemp when he got the call down in New Orleans that he was not going to be on the ticket in 1988. It wasn't a surprise. He wasn't really expected to be. But the Bush team treated him well and talked him up and uh, treated him really well by the end of the day. There was never much of a thought, though, if Bush won, he would join the ticket and become part of the administration. But right after the election, um, he got called by Craig Fuller, who was at the time the, the vice president, the president-elect's chief of staff. And I was with him that day, and, he's, and he asked him to come down and meet with the incoming president, which I went down with him. And he really didn't know what, what, what this was about. And he was, uh, they went in for, this was in the old executive office building where the vice president had his office. He was the president-elect. This was in early December, I think right after Thanksgiving. 
And um, I didn't go in the meeting, I sat out in the, in the hallway, but uh, he offered him the position and Kemp came out very excited about having been offered this position and wanting to go home and talk to Joanne and the family about it. But he was really pumped up because I think the experience of having run for president, obviously been a, a member of Congress where he was a leading intellectual giant, but then running for president and seeing how public policy is made and how campaigns are run and how message works and motivates people. I think he saw this as a real opportunity to go in and do something non-traditional, something a Republican had never really done before, take kind of a backwater department that had been neglected for eight years by the Reagan administration. The pre President Reagan didn't even know his HUD secretary's name, he called him Mr. Mayor, um, <laughs> and, try to, and try to elevate these ideas that Steve was just talking about. Uh, and take it to a new level. So it was an, he saw it as an opportunity. We'll get into more what we tried to do, but that was really how it was set up. And what did he say to you about coming on as chief of staff? Well, I first came in as his executive assistant because we didn't really know what we were doing. <laughs> and um, he asked me to come and join him. Again, I had just spent a lot of time. I had first met him back in the 84 campaign when I was a young field guy for the Reagan Bush campaign. When he had come to New Hampshire, and, and as Steve said, just kind of energized groups of people for the campaign, and I, we all saw something there. But he asked me to come over and help him set it up, and my early role was really recruiting men like Al Del Bovey and John Weicker to join the team. We kind of tried to set up a, you know, he, you know, we all recognized if we get a good team over here, then we could go out and do something. And knowing we didn't have a lot of government experience, we turned to someone like Al, who had run a big department at DOT that we thought he could help be our partner on running the place. Because that was our first challenge. How do you run an operation like this? I was frankly surprised that Jack did get the call. I was standing next to him at the convention when uh, the, the call came selecting the VP. And I think at the convention, Jack had thousands and thousands of people at the reception for him all championing his selection as vice president. So uh, it was somewhat of a surprise because there is some competition within uh, the Bush uh, administration. Uh, I think Jack was somewhat of a threat uh, to that administration. So I was a little surprised that, uh, that he was uh, invited into the administration since he, since he, ha he was so popular at the convention. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so how did you hear that he was going to be the nominee instead of you? <laughs> for, for HUD? Uh, I, it was announced. Uh, they, you know how they do it in Washington. They never call you and say no. They, you, you, you turn on the TV and they say, Jack Kemp has been selected HUD secretary. And uh, so that's, that's how, how it did, went. Did, did Jack call you afterwards? This is interesting. Um, uh, Jack expected me to call him and congratulate him. And when I didn't, he said, Bob, you didn't call me to congratulate me. I said, Jack, did it ever occur to you that maybe I'm disappointed? <laughs> he said, oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, yeah, that's fine. So he asked me, would I come as his undersecretary? And I said, absolutely not. Uh, so, but I would be delighted why did you, to. Why did you do that? I, I wasn't looking for a job at the time. You're either a HUD secretary or you're not. <laughs> And, and you were at that time? Uh, I was vetted and, yeah, no, no, uh, I, mean, and I was what interviewed. Was your, what, what was your job? Oh, I was the, the founder and president of my current organization, Center for Neighborhood Enterprise. Uh, and as I said, I, I, I flew in and met with Sununu and President Bush, and we talked about the job. But I, I, I mean, Jack, uh, of course, I think was the, the likely uh, selection. So I supported it afterwards. But I told him I'd help him, but not. <laughs> working for him. Right. So how did the two of you uh, come to work for, for HUD and what, what did Jack say that he wanted to get done when, when, he, when you got hired? <coughs> uh, Jack called me on the morning of the president's inauguration and said uh, he wanted to talk to me, had to talk to me right away and that we should meet after the inauguration. How, did he, how, had, he, how had he known you? Uh, I had been at the Urban Mass Transit Administration. Uh, we had had some interaction over projects uh, there and uh, I guess I was uh, viewed as a, a pretty good manager in the Reagan administration, and uh, that's what uh, uh, Jack said he was uh, is looking for. As it turned out, we didn't get together that day. We got together uh, uh, shortly thereafter, and um, 
Jack basically said that he needed somebody to operate the thing day to day to help uh, keep the trains running on time, so to speak, and uh, uh, offered me the job. And I was uh, frankly very excited. I was under consideration for a deputy secretary job at another department, and which was the reason for the call. He had gotten wind of that, <laughs> and uh, uh, basically uh, uh, said that you know he, he he didn't want me to to go the other way. But I was excited. I mean, his, he was the, the exciting uh, domestic uh, uh, policy uh, uh, person, uh, probably the most exciting uh, of the, the, the whole Bush cabinet. And, uh, you know, to be there was, was, uh, was uh, going to be a lot more fun than to be in some backwater, uh, you know, with uh, Bill Bennett or uh, whoever else uh, there, there, there might have been uh, uh, around. I mean, it's just to... Uh, what was, was the other department? Uh, the other department was not Bill Bennett's department. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was the, uh, uh, it was the uh, Department of Transportation, yeah. which I loved, and yeah, I was actually yeah. uh, yeah. very torn. But I had been there for eight years in the Reagan mm -hmm. administration, and I figured, uh, let me try something new for breakfast. Mm -hmm. John? I got to know Jack primarily during the uh, uh, period between the election and the inauguration. Uh, Stuart Butler at Heritage convened several times groups of uh, housing uh, experts and other people. Uh, to talk to Jack about the various issues that he would be having to deal with and to talk about uh, what he might want to do at HUD. And uh, I had the background, of, as I said, of having been chief economist at HUD and I'd been on a couple of uh, housing commissions and uh, I knew more about the uh, subjects that uh, we were talking about, I think it's fair to say, than anyone else in the room. And after the second or third of these meetings, he asked me if I'd come and talk to him. And I, I did. I talked to him and Mary. And uh, he offered me the job. Um, so wh where, what do we know about where Jack's interest in urban problems originates? Now, he, he was an advocate in Congress of enterprise zones and home ownership, uh, mm -hmm. uh, public housing home ownership. But um, UDAG grants and community development block grants and homelessness I, I don't associate with that with his congressional agenda. So, uh, well, Jack's congressional agenda was all about opportunity, mm -hmm. and uh, you know the rich people are already rich. So Jack wasn't worried about making them mm -hmm. uh, rich. He was worried. His concern was making poor people rich. That's mm -hmm. that was the whole model was all about taking people who didn't have anything and getting them uh, asset uh, wealthy, uh, and uh, what he deplored was the uh, the past war on poverty of which the old HUD was uh, mm -hmm. was part of and he used to like to say uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, declared war on poverty and poverty won uh, trillions of billions of dollars were spent and uh, we weren't any better off so Jack's whole paradigm was about taking people who didn't have anything giving them opportunity creating assets creating jobs home ownership all of that so they would have wealth let me let me just say that mm -hmm. Early on, when Jack was in uh, the Congress, he introduced me to Vin Weber, Steve Bartlett, Gingrich. They were all freshmen. Mm -hmm. And they organized the Opportunity Society. And that were a group of freshmen, Republican, conservative congressmen. And, and so Jack uh, came to my office one day when I had about 10 resident leaders from around mm -hmm. the country meeting. Jack called and said, C could he come over? And he came in with a yellow legal pad. And he sat for three hours and listened to the residents talk about how they were empowering themselves, how they were operating laundry rooms, how they were dri driving the drug dealers out. And, and Jack just made copious notes and then said to me, Bob, we've got to do something to help these people. And from that experience, uh, Jack, uh, uh, work with David Caprera and myself. David was on the, and we began to, uh, he said, well, Bob, what are the barriers that they face? And so we uh, listed mm -hmm. these barriers in several meetings with Jack, and that we came up with seven amendments to the Housing Act that Jack said, oh, well, Bob, uh, and so what happened, the Opportunity Society did something. They had hearings in public housing here in Washington, D.C., where they were uh, Republican, conservative members mm -hmm. of Congress were asking low-income people in their community about their strengths, how do they drug, drive the drug dealers out, mm -hmm. how do they hold their own members to, uh, to be accountable. 
and all of the Washington press corps had it in the front page of the papers. And then the liberal uh, uh, Gonzalez Banking Committee felt they had to hold forth. So they came two weeks later asking me, could they have hearings? But Jack really pushed this agenda. And as a consequence, we had, he says, Bob, uh, Democrats control the House. If it's a Republican initiative, it's dead on arrival. You get me one Democrat, and I'll get you 100 Republicans. So I recruited uh, Walter Fontroy, who joined with Jack in, in supporting these seven amendments. And, and in the Senate, uh, Jack introduced me to Bill Armstrong, conservative co uh, senator from Colorado. And then we got Alan Dixon from Illinois to co-sponsor in the Senate. And as a result, we had hearings um, and that, that the, and as a result, people were saying, these low-income people are championing a conservative bill, but these are our people. <laughs> and, and so uh, what's significant is that everyone said to Jack, why are you worrying about public housing residents? They are of no political value to us. Mm -hmm. But Jack believed that good, good policies uh, make uh, good politics. And Jack was a man of integrity, and, and he also, as Al said, believed strongly in the empowerment of people. And as a result, we had these seven amendments to the Housing Act passed through Jack Kemp's leadership. And uh, President Reagan signed them into law, flanked by myself and seven resident leaders. Uh, so, and, but Jack Kemp single-handedly made that happen at a time when it was not politically popular, even among his own colleagues. Scott, where? where What's your impression of where his interest in all this came from? Well, I think it came from his upbringing and playing pro football mm -hmm. and being a member, all the things Bob just ticked through. But as I'm listening to this, I remember the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges we had was when we got to HUD, we kind of inherited this mess. And it would have been very easy, which most people in this town would have just done, to just focus on reform and you would have done mm -hmm. well and you would have been gotten all your clapping and everything and everybody would have moved on and our challenge as a team was constantly to deal with the mess the reform but at the same time try to push forward with some type of an offensive agenda which was what Kemp really wanted to do anyway mm -hmm. and that was a constant struggle and that was why designing a good strong team and it was a strong team of men and women that sometime were a little stronger than we wanted them to be to uh, focus on running the place taking care of the reforms, answering the inspector general, dealing with the Congress, but at the same time, Jack was able Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to be running around the country going to non-traditional places, barrios, ghettos, mm -hmm. a lot of these places with Bob Woodson, and it was really eye-opening. And the press was amazingly positive. Yeah. It caught the political intelligentsia, it caught uh, reporters that, you know, would never, everybody thought Kemp was kind of done. They were sending him over to HUD, and he was dealing with all those. You know, I remember our first day, literally the first day I was there, we had Robin Hood. Remember Robin Hood, yes. the woman that ran the D.C. office that for years was stealing all the money? And she was, she was living in a house out in Prince George's County with a big, one of those big dishes on her roof, and she had a big RV in her front yard. And they came in, and they said she had been stealing all the money for two years. I mean, those are the kind of things we had to deal with, literally on a day-in, day-out basis. At the same time, push forward with an agenda. And uh, mm -hmm. when I was talking to Al before we started here, I mean, he had his little card. I mean, we learned a few things from politics, but if you, if you don't have a five or six simple messages, you're not going to get through. And we printed up these little cards and gave them to everybody in the department. Basically said, if, you know, if, this, if, if what you're talking to us about is not one of these five or six major initiatives, don't talk to us. Go back and do something else. And it was really a motivating deal to get all these, I don't remember how many employees there were, but it was a huge number. There were 80 offices. Um, it was a motivating factor to kind of push forward an agenda, and it really worked. What was on the card? <laughs> well, here's the card. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's it kind is, of interesting. I lost uh, my card. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, here's a, a reproduction of it, but uh, it, we called it Recapturing the uh, American Dream, and actually, when I first uh, uh, sat after I agreed to, and, and the White House agreed that I, I could go to HUD and not somewhere else, uh, I sat down with Jack, and, and you know, let's face it, Jack, Jack had a multitude of agendas and ideas, and uh, part of our task 
was keeping Jack on focus <laughs> and on <laughs> on message, which was not exactly the uh, uh, always the easiest uh, thing to do. Because uh, you know, at HUD we had uh, we really had uh, uh, five business lines. We had HUD. We had the NFL, whatever was going on in the NFL, with, with his buddies <laughs> there, they were there. There was the Jack Kemp family, and, and they were first in his heart, so, you know, whatever was going on, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, Jimmy was just uh, in his senior year in high school that year, uh, and had just, uh, mm -hmm. right about the time that Jack was sworn in, I think is when he signed to go mm -hmm. to, uh, to Wake Forest. So we had the, HUD, the Jack Kemp family business. Then we had the Opportunity Society uh, mm -hmm. activities and what his buddies on, on the Hill were doing. And Jack never left the Opportunity Society caucus or, or whatever it was. I mean, he was on the phone with Nude and Vin Weber and everybody else and, uh, all, mm -hmm. all the time. And then we had the HUD foreign policy, uh, <laughs> which uh, we operated. So it was five businesses and it was a little difficult uh, uh, day to day to, to, you know, I was brought in to run HUD uh, or, or help him run HUD. So what do you want to do, Jack? And um, uh, we basically uh, pulled out these five priorities and they were expanding home ownership and affordable housing opportunities, creating jobs and economic development through enterprise zones, empowering the poor through resident uh, uh, management and, and homesteading, uh, enforcing fair housing uh, for all and helping to make public housing uh, uh, drug free. Mm -hmm. Now that's five. The, the actual fifth one was helping to end the tragedy of homelessness. So the original were five but it didn't have the drug free. Then mm -hmm. uh, Jack went on a trip with, I think Bob was with him, and saw the, the tragedy of, of drug addiction going on in public housing. So he came back and he said, well, it's no more five, now it's six. <laughs> so I, can we do that? I said, Jack, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> but I can only manage five or six. You know, I can't manage 500 or 600. Uh, we've got to get this down to a reasonable number. So if you want to go with six, that's it, but stop the presses. So that's what we did. Sherry Rollins uh, then yeah. came up with the idea to print up these uh, uh, mm -hmm. These little cards, and she we had this plastic. She was the, uh, she was the Sh communications. Sherry was person. our yeah. assistant secretary for uh, public relations, with whatever it was. Communications. Uh, communications, and of course, the card looked pretty dull. It was priorities of HUD. I had you know one to six. I was the, you know the management guy. It wasn't so Jack. You know. Right away, you had to write priorities of HUD under President George Bush and Secretary Jack Kemp. So there was a banner. We added that. And then Sherry added the tagline, recapturing the American dream. And that was our theme. We put it on everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the cafeteria, as a matter of fact, there were TV screens over the uh, where people checked out their lunch. And we used to put the priorities up there uh, with pictures of Jack at, at, e at each issue. I mean, we made this the central uh, part of, of the department and our mm -hmm. recruiting uh, for uh, the, the team that we put together. John, did you? Uh, Scott mentioned uh, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, scandal problem. Uh, I had been at OMB from November of 87 till I came over to HUD with Secretary Kemp, and I never heard anything at OMB about impending scandals at HUD. And I, was, I knew the people who were in the housing branch well. I had known them before I came to OMB. And it was news to everyone. And the summer of 1989 was the most exhilarating summer of my life because every day you picked up the paper to see what HUD story was on the front page now. What have we It wasn't learned? a good story. Never. Uh, we, ha we had uh, the Robin Hood, Robin Hood uh, business. We had uh, problems with a program that we had inherited from the uh, previous administration, multifamily co-insurance. Uh, they went on and on and on. And Jack, Jack Put, asked us, told us to get together and figure out how we could reform HUD, what procedures we could put in place that would prevent this from happening in the future. And so we sat in his conference room a uh, couple of hours a day for several weeks. Uh, luckily enough, I had to have my gallbladder out during part of that, and so I didn't have to do all of it. Uh, we, put, uh, we put the legislation together. Uh, he took it to the Hill, and they passed it almost verbatim in about three months. But while we were doing this, he would come into the meetings and he would say, remember why we're here. We didn't come here to reform HUD. I didn't come here to be the Secretary of Reform. 
he wanted to be the secretary of empowering people and everything he did, not just tenant ownership, resident management, enterprise zones, everything he did uh, fit into that agenda. A whole bunch of smaller programs which didn't get the same publicity, but the idea was always how can we use our housing programs to help people uh, become empowered, live better lives, acquire the skills and the initiative to become productive members of society. And I think if we had not passed, done that reform agenda, uh, tenant ownership and resident management would never have gotten through Congress. It, the fact that he pushed this through, had, had worked it out, made a, a difference in the way he was perceived politically by his former colleagues. So uh, how, did he f how did he find out about the scandals? <laughs> <laughs> He, he walks into HUD and he, 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 nobody knows about it and then all of a sudden it blows up? Well, we, we, we got in the briefings when we started going through briefings. We learned a little. There were problems in parts of housing and other places. But literally, uh, in the transition period, the inspector general that happened, a gentleman named Paul Adams, who had been writing all these reports and sending them upstairs, all of a sudden they started flooding out and people started reading them. And um, it was a nonstop battle. And just... Um, I want to reiterate one thing John just said. It was important to get the reform agenda and get it done so we could move on and be offensive. But the real backstory on the reform agenda is we spent months, Al and John and Mary and everybody, collecting everybody's ideas from the department. And I think we came up with like 125 solid ideas, and then we culled them down to about 50 or so. Normally when you do something like this in our recommending legislation, you send it over to OMB, they comment on it, it goes back and forth, and then you put it together. Well, we, we at the time knew that if we did that, it would never get done, they'd nitpick us forever. So I remember the night we had announced we were going to announce it the next day and have a big press conference at HUD, and we informed OMB that night at about 5 o'clock on the way we're doing this tomorrow. They went absolutely bonkers, demanded to talk to Kemp. He had gone home. so. Uh, we said, well, come on over in the morning. I remember da Al and you and I walking in this room. There must have been 30 of them there in our conference room the next morning. And we said, well, here's what we're doing. There's nothing overly controversial here. And we walked through the public relations part of what we were going to do that day. And we did it at 10 o'clock. And it took off. And it was more of a snowball that Kemp created in the public opinion that this ought to be done. It, it didn't go through the traditional check and balance that goes normally on with OMB. It upset our friends at OMB. We never had a great relationship after then, but we didn't really care because it worked. So it how, was, how, how uh, what, what was the timing of all this? How, how late it, into your tenure was that? Oh, this was in the summer. This was yeah. May or June, if I'm not, I remember yeah, I mean, it was hot. We discovered the, uh, the, the problems in the early spring. Uh, I believe we had the entire reform agenda put together sometime uh, in the summer. Jack being Jack, we had the little cards already. So for reform, and as John is absolutely right, uh, uh, there was no question reform was, he wasn't going to be the secretary of reform. So we had a, we had a, a, a package, uh, we called it reform of HUD under, uh, uh, under uh, President George Bush and Secretary Kemp. And then Jack gave it the slogan, clearing the decks. The idea was we wanted to mm -hmm. clear the decks for what we wanted to do. And it basically was three components. It was ethics, it was management and finance, and uh, FHA reform. And uh, it was signed by the president on uh, December 15th. And between that time, we didn't stop in terms of working on the five, the six priorities. Uh, we had people working on that so that once the decks were cleared, which theoretically they were on December 15th when the president signed the legislation, we could go right into the, uh, the six priorities mm -hmm. and, and, and the agenda, which was the opportunity agenda. It was what he came there to do. Steve, do you have anything to add? You were watching this from Indianapolis? No, I mean, uh, these gentlemen worked with him, and, and I was just a beneficiary of his ideas. I, I, I would say, though, I was surprised that nobody mentioned that he's from Buffalo, right? Because you know, the problem we have is, um, generally, Republican disinterest and Democrat hostility, right? And they don't add up to a very good agenda for urban America, right? So, so if, you, if, you've, if you've served in a district, right, where uh, the population is diverse, where there are not insubstantial amounts of poverty, where if, and if you have indeed a, a, a commitment, right, that, that everyone has a right to an opportunity to develop the best they can be, then these policies are, seem to me, a, a terribly logical evolution of that background, right? And so, um, that's, I mean, I'm not, I mean, I, I don't know Jack Kemp then, but as the beneficiary of his work and seeing it from the same exact perspective, right? And, 
And the other issue is, you know, those, those, those thoughts flow through. I mean, I had a little bit to do with uh, compassionate conservatism in 2000, right? And if you stare at compassionate conservatism in 2000, uh, although, you know, other than kind of whispering to several of us, Jack didn't really write it, but, but he did write, write it, right? I mean, es essentially. So I, I would just kind of reiterate what everybody said. Uh, but over and above that, um, uh, if you're not in Washington and you're in Indianapolis or L.A. or whatever, the rhetoric of empowerment is a lot more important than the reform of HUD. I mean, it really is. It's, it's, it's a language. It's invigorating. It sets a tone. And uh, I think we're fortunate that, uh, that he didn't spend all his time just trying to reform HUD. It would not have had anything near the amplification that his policies had. Right. We're, we're going to go on to, to, to all the other stuff. But there's a, I saw a quote from you somewhere. That, that said that fraud, theft, influence peddling, and serious mismanagement uh, were involved in 28 programs representing 94 percent of the money that HUD spent and collected. So the, it sounds like the, right. the, the place was a, to, was a total mess. The uh, place was dysfunctional. Uh, it had audit findings uh, in the thousands. Uh, that hadn't been uh, uh, dealt with, and uh, it, it uh, certainly was a major distraction, but I think we managed it well because we did clear the decks and we did get to move on to the rest of the agenda. Okay, and we'll go to the rest of the agenda. Uh, now, when, when Kemp was sw sworn in at HUD, George Bush actually came there, and George Bush made a speech that embodied the, the Kemp agenda of enterprise zones and tenant management, tenant ownership, ending, ho and ending the tragedy of homelessness and, and that sort of thing. Um, did he really mean it or was this just rhetoric on Bush's part? Oh, I think he meant it. I think those were comments that he had seen Kemp make and used during his campaign and picked up on. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, Bush totally meant it like the idea of picking Kemp, which was a little outside of the box, <laughs> uh, which would kind of keep his team off balance a little, which is kind of his management style in a good way. And uh, look, that event with the president coming to the HUD cafeteria was a real game changer in that HUD had been treated as a backwater for years. The president of the United States was coming to, the employees were there. It was a special event. It sent a signal that there's a new day, there's a new level of seriousness. And again, we hadn't found out about all these scandals by the time that happened. But it was a good way to start the relationship because one of the things Jack did, Al's pointed it out twice today, he'd always go back and it was President Bush's department and Jack Kemp's department. And it, he was always good at bringing the Bush White House in when we needed to show there was a higher level of what we were doing. It was smart politics and it worked well. Um, that is a question that wasn't just for President Bush, for, for conservatives, period. Uh, as Steve alluded to, I think Bill Bennett summed it up. He said when liberals see poor people, they see a sea of victims, and conservatives see a sea of aliens. So, the, the, and, and that, that tension continues to exist uh, with, uh, with uh, Republicans and with conservatives. The very fact that Steve Goldsmith, who I've worked with for six years, uh, was a popular urban mayor in a city where there was a large black Democratic population, and yet he received a lot of support for re-election, uh, which was an anomaly at the time. And Jack Kemp, who, because of his experiences in the NFL with racial discrimination and taking, had, having to take a position, was sensitive to urban, they represent the exceptions. And, uh, and, I don't, and so I think that that, that question more continues to exist today um, uh, with that is a subject of, should be a subject of more discussion uh, within the uh, conservative movement, to what extent are they committed to empowering people? Or are they committed to uh, winning the argument? Um, so uh, when, when the 1992 riots, and we'll, we'll get to all this <coughs> chronologically, but when the 1992 riots broke out, there was a, an unending stream of stories that said that there basically there was no Bush um, administration urban agenda the Jack Kemp was it and that the White House really didn't care about it and Bush finally woke up to it 
when the streets of uh, Los Angeles were burning. Now, to what extent did Bush, beyond, you know, coming to the to the HUD swearing in, inspire his, the rest of his administration to support the Jack Kemp agenda? Well. Um, I have one outlier story. I, mean, I, I have some reservations speaking in front of these four Jack Kemp insiders, but so. Um, so after the riots, the president calls half a dozen mayors. And so um, I go back to the White House, and there's a group of folks. The president was in and out, so let's leave the president out of the story for a second. And the issue was, why doesn't America understand our urban agenda, right? And Jack was there, and a few of us. And um, those of us who were sympathetic to the president and in urban America were unsure what the administration's urban agenda was, other than Jack Kemp. That's right. And, and then in, when Jack would speak, it was at, at nobody, it, it, he, was, he was the outlier. Nobody else really was invigorated. Nobody else would chime in. There was no, it, it was Jack saying what he was for, which was what we were for, but it wasn't clear that that was a pervasive ag agenda. I left that meeting as, as a Bush advocate, a Kemp advocate, a Republican mayor, and uh, still disturbed. Who else was in the meeting? Uh, Chief of Staff, I mean, the top folks in the White House at the time and four mayors. I'm not trying to be sharply critical. I'm just trying to say I think there was an incongruence here right. and, and some um, gap between Jack Kemp and what, what we saw as what we wanted the policy to be and the fact that it was not deeply pervasive and it was not clear in either its execution or its articulation. So I'm not trying to be so much critical as saying I left there, you know, it, it, well, let me just, I'll, I'll be redundant just for a second. So, so when they said, t t I don't know which one of the mayors said in response to the chief of staff saying, we're disturbed that nobody knows what our urban policy is. The guy next to me said, what is it, right, other than Jack? And um, I, I left kind of uh, concerned about that. Well, that was the climate that existed. I mean, let's face it, Kemp was pretty much allowed to do over at HUD what he wanted to do. It wasn't a super top priority. I, I believe prior to that time, and I left the last year, We'd only had one presidential event with the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. It was over in Alexandria. It took about seven minutes to get there, do it, and back. And that was, in, and when you're watching uh, people in Washington, one of the ways you're graded is how much time you spend with the president. Mm -hmm. Out on the road. Or are you taken out on the road? And uh, there was not a high level of commitment there. We, uh, you know, we didn't sit around and pout about it. We recognized, well, this is the way it's going to be. Let's take advantage of it. Let's go. And we moved, and we moved out and moved Kemp around the country in a, in a manner that was one notch down from a presidential level in the in sense of the type of events he did, the crowds he did, the type of press coverage he got. By the way, the type of members of Congress that all of a sudden all wanted to be there was overwhelming. I mean, we had to, our congressional relations operation was second to none because now all of a sudden everybody wanted to get on the bandwagon. So it was something that grew over time. It wasn't you know, no one waved the wand. We just saw an opening and we took it. Let me just add a footnote. Uh, when uh, at that time, uh, I think the Republican uh, National Convention was in Houston, Texas, and it was a very fractured kind of convention. 92, 92 right. right. But the only issue where there was a consensus was the resident management ownership of public housing. And it was on the front page when it, the platform committee mm -hmm. passed it. Yep. It was on the front page of the Houston Chronicle. Uh, and it became, uh, and, and that was, so, so Jack's contribution to that, bringing the party together and leading the nation uh, was recognized at the convention. But again, it, it was, as soon as the, the, the election was won. Um, yeah, but think of what, what the other side of his tone was in Houston that was both important and, and, and not so uh, um, widely accepted, which is this uh, advocacy for diversity and, and folks left behind. Right? I mean, that was a convention where, uh, you know, there were some tough messages there, and Jack was, was you know, the, the voice of discontent against those messages, right? So right. He was, which messages now? Uh, um, uh, um, uh, this is a continuing, you know, Battle that Bob and I have the messages of inclusivity and 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 uh, and tolerance and we're talking about the 1992 92, convention. yeah yeah 
So, I mean, so Jack is there in one way as a as a motivating. And it, both of his messages were good. I'm just saying that there, one that was widely celebrated, and the other it continues to today, which is how much you're going to do you pay attention to minorities and diversity and 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 those issues. And for those of us who who follow and admire Jack, there inherent in a Republican philosophy, but for many Republicans they're not. They're, they're aberrant in a Republican philosophy, and, and I think those two, two messages are a little bit off. Mm -hmm. One thing to keep in mind here, this is also the four years when the Soviet Union came apart and the Warsaw Pact disintegrated, and that was the big issue of our time. It, re yeah. it really Not was. You mentioned the Gulf War. Yeah. Uh, and the Gulf War yeah. was in there too, uh, and it's not unreasonable for the president, whoever the president is, to be devoting a good deal of his time to foreign policy issues. This was a period that we had never seen this. I didn't expect to see the Soviet Union collapse in my lifetime. And uh, when it happened, I got my small children up there on the TV and said, look at this. And they said, what, what's this? I said, remember this. And I, there must have been millions of us around the country uh, doing that. And that developed after uh, the administration started after President Bush came to HUD, and there were new, there were new things on his agenda which nobody had expected to be there. Right. Okay. Um, one of the other, uh, as I'm told, one of the other first priorities of uh, Kemp at HUD was improving the morale of the mm -hmm. bureaucracy, which I gather was very low, not even before the scandals. So, tell me about that. Well, it started with him having a. Uh, really an open door policy which for some of us on the staff was kind of frustrating we'd, we'd come back from lunch and there'd be 10 or 12 people in his <laughs> office with him talk that he would have gone down to the cafeteria that day and talked with and brought back up to his office so it was kind of humorous some days uh, the first thing he did was he ripped out the whole cafeteria he said this place is a dump it's on a, no one can eat down here he brought in a privatized group to fix it and that was, as I remember, Sharon, one of the first things that he did that really kind of changed the morale. Yeah. But it was just the whole way, you know, and there were all these really depressing pictures all over the building that we tore down of, of just awful, depressing projects. And we put up more patriotic, mm -hmm. upbeat pictures and tried to just change the tone. I mean, we used to call it 10 floors of basement. I mean, it was a very depressing building. And uh, until we put up lights and changed the atmospherics and made the cafeteria nicer, coupled with Kemp bouncing around the building. I mean, he didn't just sit up on his 10th floor office behind the glass and tell, the, t you know, tell everybody what to do. He was all over that building. You know, he wanted to talk to Weicker. He'd just go down to 6 or 9 or wherever he was and do it. And at that, that whole mentality, I mean, I'm, I'm still in HUD a little these days for some clients. And people still remember me. And they remember Kemp. And they remember the attitude that he brought into the building, the upbeat attitude, and people respected him. And it still carries on today, 20 years later. That's true. I was there. I've been there in and out on various policy issues the last few years, to say nothing of the four years I was there uh, as FHA commissioner. And uh, Jack came in after eight years when, well, Secretary Pierce was not a hands-on manager. And you couldn't run that place without being a hands-on manager. And uh, Jack provided. Uh, a good deal of enthusiasm and energy, and Al and Scott and some others kept the place working and working, uh, uh, working honestly and honorably. I, I brought in my uh, field economists for a meeting, and one of them uh, took me apart, an economist in Mississippi, and said, you really have to fix this place. Our neighbors think we're a joke. He met his personal neighbors, and there was no morale worth thinking of. You know, I think uh, a couple of days a week when Jack would come to work, he would get off the elevator at some other floor <laughs> and walk around. Uh, he was always in the cafeteria <laughs> passing, and he was, you know, and, uh, you know, I actually mm -hmm. never knew, because he'd show up in my office and say, the tacos are no good in the cafeteria today. <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't know that I was the taco <laughs> manager, but uh, uh, I'd have to find out whatever was the matter with that. I mean, but it, it could be uh, uh, something in public housing that he, he'd get off the elevator and he'd be talking to somebody and find out that the filing cabinets didn't work or whatever it was, uh, he'd listen and uh, uh, we'd, d we'd deal with it. So, um, according to Sharon Zalaska, who you were referring to, his... Uh, his um, assistant, personal assistant or executive assistant, um, he the, the cafeteria got fixed because he had a, a tuna fish sandwich 
that he didn't like that it turned out didn't even come from the cafeteria. <laughs> but nonetheless, the, the employees were all the beneficiary of, uh, of, that, of that error. So did he, did he actually have lunch in the cafeteria or did he? Occasionally, uh, occasionally. Uh, he, he, would, he, he would certainly go down there yeah. all the time uh, when he was passing by and yeah. talk to people. And uh, I guess if they got a complaint, I got a complaint. I don't know. It, uh, uh, but he was, he was on top of it. But it was he used his retail political skills that he honed in Congress over 20 years and running for president to work the building. And it changed the way people thought about going to work every day. And that was the big fundamental difference. Okay. Now, what, what kind of an administrator was he? I mean, his, his, you, you were citing all, all the agendas that he had. Uh, only one of them had to do with HUD. Uh, so how did he manage his time doing all of that? And how on top of the business of the department was he? He was very much on top of the business of the department. Uh, you know, that, that was one of the things that most amazed me uh, because, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but he was very good at with just one or two questions getting right down to where we were and where the results were. Uh, he was, uh, uh, it, it was, was fascinating as uh, that, that management uh, ability, but uh, as he once said to me, you know, uh, I'm used to having 55,000 screaming maniacs uh, yelling while I'm trying to do a play, so, uh, you know, I can, I can handle this stuff. Uh, I can handle stress. Uh, I mean, but his, his congressional office, it, it was described as frenetic or that he was a scrambling quarterback, that he had a million things to do, that he was disorganized, his desk was piled up with papers. So was, was I mean, that was all true, but yeah. there, and it was true in HUD. The, the HUD office was not exactly uh, the most orderly uh, uh, place, but that didn't mean that he couldn't find exactly the piece of paper that he wanted. He had that folder that he used to carry around with all of this stuff in it, uh, but he knew exactly what he wanted to do at, at, at all times. And, you know, the, the HUD office, there was a, it was like a library. It had all these books uh, around it. He could pull out uh, any book. That, that he needed with a quote that he wanted uh, at any time. It was just uh, uh, amazing. So, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I was never a uh, NFL quarterback. Uh, uh, maybe that's where you get the skill. Maybe Jimmy can tell us uh, 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 something about it. But uh, I always remember that, uh, that quote about the, uh, the 55,000 uh, screaming uh, uh, fans uh, uh, and, and, uh, and his, his, his saying that because he was used to doing that. Uh, that's what he did uh, uh, every week. And it seemed that uh, if he could handle them in Buffalo, <laughs> he had no problem with the uh, House Banking Committee in Washington, D.C. Um, so uh, just uh, to, uh, to understand what the place looked like, he has a hu much huger office, bigger office at HUD than he ever had as, as a congressman. Mm -hmm. How was it all laid out and what? He had a big work? office with a great view of the, the river, and it was laid out with his working area at a desk, and then there was a couch area for casual meetings, and there was a conference table for us for the working mm -hmm. part of the day. There was an outer office, and there was a bigger conference room where we would have bigger meetings. We would have our senior staff meetings that he would attend. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it was very much a working office. I mean, Al's being nice here. I mean, look, we designed an operation to work with Kemp. I mean, he was mm -hmm. used to being a congressman. That, told everybody to do the same thing, they'd all run around and then he'd go vote. I mean, this was a little different. And so we designed a, a, a group, Sharon, Mary, myself on the inside, and then with all the men and women that were assistant secretaries, everybody knew their role. There was no gray area. It was very black and white on what you were responsible for. That's why having the card was so helpful, mm -hmm. because that's how we managed the place. If not, you, you couldn't manage a place like this if it didn't have that direction. And mm -hmm. his role was to give it the direction every week or so, internally, externally. People read the clips, knew what he was saying, and uh, that's how we managed, and it worked. Um, now, he, he, also, he also made a lot of trips, right from, right, right from the get-go, right, to visit homeless shelters and that sort of thing. How often was he out making a speech or making a visit? Well, in the beginning, we did what we call offensive trips, where we wanted to go out on each of our agenda items and make a statement and make some news. And then, after those took off, we had just a barrage of members of Congress wanting him to come. And, you know, the whole member of Congress relationship was really quite interesting, because in a way, he was his own congressional relations guy. Right. He knew all these people. 
you know, when you run a department, the appropriators really matter, <laughs> your authorizers matter, and the rest really don't. And he had relationships with these men and women, and he was able to deal with them where normally if you're a secretary and you have to go up and testify, you take days and weeks of preparation. Well, he could get the big picture, go up there, charm the birds out of the tree, and get what he wanted and get out of there and get back on the road. So there wasn't a set, you know, we would react to what we needed to react to, but we spent most of our time trying to proactively plan what we needed to do to move the agenda and be relevant in the political time. Because uh, what? Because there was a huge void yeah. and we tried to fill it. What we did when Jack would call me and um, he was getting ready to go on the road, I said to Jack, I said, Jack, do me a favor. When you're ready to go to these cities, do not get off the plane and go downtown and speak to Rotary. You get off the plane and you go to public housing mm -hmm. first. <laughs> and then you invite the mayors and the governors to join you because those liberal governors may have never been to public housing, even though they are supposed. And that became the, 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 the procedure. I remember we got off the plane and we would uh, go up to in Caprini Green, there would be a big sign, welcome Secretary Kemp. And then he would invite these uh, liberal officials to join him, and they, they were embarrassed at the coming. And then Jack would always invite a group of the leaders to join him at the Sheraton Hotel. With, they would be at a front table, and Jack would reference them in his speech. And, that be, and that's what happened in each of the cities. Uh, I remember in Boston, a group of protesters were coming to protest when he came to Bromley Heath, and they got to... To the, to the project, and there were 20 young men standing around the bus telling them to get back on the bus and go home. This is where? In Boston. Mm -hmm. That Jack Kemp is our friend, and we won't see him embarrassed here. So the protesters got back on their bus and left. So Kemp was never picketed uh, anywhere he went because we arranged for the resident leaders to always welcome him, and that's, uh, that became a standard procedure. Yeah. So, you know, Mort, uh, again, I'm the, kind of the outsider, but just focus on the conversation for a second. I mean, there is obviously a tension between being a, uh, uh, the uh, leading voice to America in an area and, uh, and the time it takes out of the building and the most uh, technically proficient housing administrator in the country, right? And I don't know that had Jack been the, uh, the inside the building perfect administrator, we'd be here today, right? So, <laughs> I mean, so, so mm -hmm. this, there are trade-offs in this, right? You know, and you have to recognize those trade-offs, and I think we're the beneficiary of the, of the balance that he chose. And I think that's kind of important, because otherwise you, you get a little too far into the administrative issues, which seem important here, and they are important for any of us who tried to deal with HUD, but but the, the programmatics were really much. Well, it sounds like Al was the inside. So I think Al's the problem, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. Probably. <laughs> yeah I, I probably was. But the reason we had, there was a reason we had these six priorities. We took them out of, I mean, they were his agenda. They were, mm -hmm. uh, they were drawn from uh, the, uh, the, the statement the president made when he selected them, the statement the president made on uh, February 13th, 1989, when he came to HUD to swear him in. Uh, and uh, uh, that was our business. So Jack's travel helped our business because he was promoting an agenda that was very clearly laid out. We didn't have to sit on the 10th floor trying to figure out what we wanted to do. We knew exactly what we came there to do. We had to figure out how to get it done. And as Scott pointed out, the way you did it was in, in Congress. We needed action. Uh, we needed action on the Hill. And in the paradoxical way of, uh, of the American democratic system, that means you need to promote it out in the hinterlands so that the people who vote on the Hill will vote for what you want. And that's exactly what he did. And every trip uh, was built around that. I'd also point out that, uh, I mean, there were some trips that were multi-day, but Jack would uh, very often come into HUD in the morning, then go out. He'd be gone that night. He might be back the next afternoon. Uh, much of the country was in flying distance, and he, took, he flew commercially uh, almost all the time that I can recall. Uh, so he was in touch with us uh, uh, and uh, knew what he wanted. And when he left, he always had a, a little to-do list. And when he came back, he remembered what he asked you to do and where, where it was. I mean, that's how he managed, uh, going back to your earlier question. Uh, and he never forgot what he asked you to do. Uh, and uh, he could be pretty stern if you didn't get it done. In the 1990 election, he was in tremendous demand for, by Republican candidates because he was the one Republican of stature who could go into 
minority areas and talk with credibility. Uh, people used to say to me, what's he running for? Is he running for president? And I kind of thought he was running for governor of Indiana because he was there over and over again on behalf of Senator Dan Coats, who had replaced uh, Senator Quayle uh, and who was making his first race for that, uh, for that seat. Great. And he was going to such uninspiring places as Gary and Hammond and East Chicago. And he was there again and again and again. But grassroots people always uh, repaid that loyalty. If you look at any file footage of Jack Kemp testifying on Capitol Hill, you will see uh, the first three rows behind him, black and brown faces, mm -hmm. because we bust people in three hours before every hearing and filled up all the seats with Kemp advocates and every time. And then they, we would bust them in and of course they used to drive the staff mad because they, Jack would get on the bus and bring 42 people back for lunch. For lunch. While, <laughs> while he had his people out there waiting to see him. Right. Jack was in there uh, the shirt, the coat off, having we, lunch with the resident leaders while you all were looking in. We'd call that another Woodson me. special is what I used to call it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what, what's your most, <laughs> what, 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 what are the standout trips that you remember Jack taking? I mean, are there certain classic visits? Oh gosh. I, 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 I think one of the first classic visits was his first trip he took here in Washington. I think you were with him, Bob. Yes. Uh, it was, it was, he had just become secretary and he hit the road the next morning and it was just kind of the beginning of something that we recognized that was different and unique and was going to be a lot of fun. Um, again, I keep going back to it, but we saw the void and we just decided to fill it. We didn't wait for anybody in the administration to tell us what to do. We kind of knew what we wanted to do. We took the president's words and we did it. Um, but the trips were all, they're all kind of a blur to me now. It was a while ago, but so it was. I remember, I remember one in St. Louis that was uh, where, because Bertha Gilkey was profiled on 60 Minutes uh, as a, in Cochran Public Housing. And so I said to Jack, uh, what we did is we had an executive bus meet his plane, and on the bus were 10 uh, CEOs of corporations and grassroots leaders on that bus and when Jack got off the plane he got, boarded the bus and then went downtown and he brought some private sector supporters for their residents. So, so when he left some of them funded the, the, the program. We wanted that to be the template for Jack not just to talk about government support but to use his reputation to bring uh, potential private sector supporters for these grassroots seats, and Jack, uh, that was a very successful visit. Again, did, did he actually spend overnights in homeless shelters? I mean, I read somewhere that he went to well, I Philadelphia. Remember, I, uh, early on, I think it was Philadelphia. There, there were one or two that uh, that uh, that he did that in the early stages, if I remember correctly. Okay, uh, what do you think his greatest accomplishments were, and then his greatest disappointments? Uh, we'll get into the the details of it, but are there? things that really stand out as major accomplishments that you could say w the world would, would, wouldn't have happened if Jack hadn't been secretary? Well, you, you have to start with the influence he had on President Reagan's campaign to run on a supply side no, model. I mean, I'm talking about HUD now. No, I know, but yeah. that, that, that transferred to everything he kind of did okay. at HUD. I mean, I think for someone that was never elected president, I think Kemp probably had more impact on public policy than anybody else. These policy initiatives we talked about back in the late 80s, early 90s that are now mainstream, you know, growth. Everybody would talk about growth and everybody would look at Kemp like he was crazy. Well, now growth is the mainstream discussion. Everybody knows we'll never get out of these problems without growth. And I think showing that going to a place like HUD that was not a top priority, that you could, by having an agenda of enterprise zones and HUD zones and taking on some of these serious problems of fairness, I think Kemp showed everybody in politics you can make a difference. And I, I can't get over the number of men and women I run into now that have met Kemp on one of these trips, on one of these Woodson trips around the country, that have been spurred on to go on and become entrepreneurs that are now wildly successful businessmen and women. And they, a lot of them all go back to Kemp giving them the optimism to go out and give it a try. I think uh, the, the main accomplishments uh, were things he did because he had to do them. 
He came to HUD, what he wanted to do was tenant ownership, resident management, enterprise zone. What he had to do was HUD reform and uh, FHA reform, which uh, I think Scott alluded to a, a few minutes ago. Uh, the FHA single family home mortgage program, the biggest thing within HUD, was supposed to be self-supporting. Uh, the premium income collected from uh, mortgagers was supposed to offset the cost of defaults and foreclosures, and it always had. But by the summer of 1989, and at the same time we're going through the SNL uh, bailout uh, legislation, by the summer of 89, the financial situation was very rocky. And so we also put together a program to uh, reform the FHA program, uh, raising down payment requirements, raising premiums, tightening underwriting standards, none of which Jack was happy about because this was making home ownership a little less available for people. But uh, he, he saw we had to do it, and we did it. And uh, tenant ownership and resident management is no longer part of the HUD agenda. It was not only a Republican campaign in 1992, President Clinton, Governor Clinton then campaigned on it as well, uh, but in 1994 they took it out of the budget and, and, uh, and repealed it. But the HUD Reform Act is still there. When I was FHA commissioner, we were operating within the context of the HUD Reform Act 12 to 15 years after it was passed. And uh, FHA reform was still there. Uh, we had established enough of a reserve uh, that we could meet the goals of the 1990 legislation. We could uh, survive a normal post-war recession or a major regional problem. And we survived the recession of 2000, 2001, and we survived Hurricane Katrina, which involved a lot of defaults on mortgages in, in the Gulf area. Uh, in fact, now the FHA Mutual Mortgage Market Insurance Fund is still barely solvent which is uh, more than you can say for Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or any subprime lender that I know of and more than a few prime lenders as well. There isn't much margin, but it's still positive. So uh, just speaking on that, uh, on that front, did, did, uh, he was an advocate of, of home ownership and expanding home ownership, but did he have any inkling that the expansion would lead to the, to the collapse of Freddie and Fannie and the collapse of the housing bubble and the collapse of the whole economy, much of which is blamed on this on this effort to make everybody in America a homeowner. Well, it wasn't. I, I think that the, the problems in housing were not caused by uh, people having home ownership. They were, they were caused by greed and the, uh, uh, the fact that, the, uh, uh, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac got off track. And uh, Jack was very concerned about that. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, he wrote to Secretary Brady uh, on August 16th of 1991, our first year, and warned that exactly what happened would happen if the administration allowed this legislation uh, to be watered down, the legislation they had uh, uh, proposed. And uh, he warned that there was inadequate capital at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, mm -hmm. that it was going to lead to abuses and, and ultimately cost the taxpayer uh, uh, money. So uh, Jack understood the difference between assets and home ownership and government mismanagement and uh, what was going on and could go on at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac if they weren't properly uh, regulated. I want to get a copy of that. Let uh, me just uh, add that the lessons uh, of Kemp, I think that Steve Goldsmith and Jack Kemp are two of the few conservative leaders that have demonstrated that conservatism has an answer for poverty and, and that it's embodied in their work. And unfortunately, uh, that lesson has been lost uh, in, a, in contemporary time. So uh, what would you say are his greatest disappointments, Scott? Oh, I, I think uh, at, at HUD, um, he would always look back and think we wish we had been able to do more in the sense of um, expand home ownership, do a better job getting the Congress to understand the seriousness, do a better job getting the administration. I think probably his disappointment, biggest disappointment was uh, not getting the administration at the time to really come along. 
and uh, because you know the president didn't get reelected that cycle, and there's a reason, and this was probably part of the symptoms of the problem. I'd, I'd, I'd put in uh, enterprise zones. He couldn't get enterprise zones through sure. Congress even after the Los Angeles riots, even after Mayor Bradley said to a Senate committee that enterprise asked what should should the Senate do. He said you must pass enterprise zones. Uh, but you won that battle 15 years later. Not exactly. Well, I mean, yeah, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, the idea it, no. it, it morphed in a slightly different way, but it, I mean, it was planted out there. Yes, but what, what, uh, what finally was enacted in the Clinton administration was, in many ways, opposite to what Jack was proposing. Jack was proposing tax incentives for people to start businesses in low-income areas and to invest in businesses in low-income areas and to work there. Incentives for capital and incentives for labor, and not picking winners. I can't count the number of times uh, he would say, we don't pick winners here. The legislation that was passed in 1993 was very much the opposite. It was, it was a set of grants to a handful of areas. Jack wanted an, the Enterprise Zone to be an entitlement for any poor community in the country. Uh, half a dozen cities got, uh, got money, and it didn't seem to make uh, Right. make much of a difference. It was it, it, empowerment zones, which I think it was Clinton's yeah. idea, were kind of old-fashioned um, uh, anti-poverty programs. Right. I mean, not, very, very yeah. much so. Yeah, and that was a disappointment because Jack wanted to give people a hand up mm -hmm. and the mayors, unfortunately, Steve, uh, you know, all they wanted was a hand out. They wanted money, money, money. Uh, they wanted to use the money for stimulus type activities, that's the way we call them today. In those days it was just a bunch of people standing on their shovels uh, uh, outside mm -hmm. uh, some uh, uh, work project uh, and nothing ever happened. And I think that was the disappointment uh, because Jack wanted to empower people uh, to build businesses, to build assets, to build success. That's what our enterprise zones were all about. Right. Uh, so so I, th I think these, your, your uh, Pairing of these questions is, is a little complicated in the following way, right? So, I mean, obviously, a, a number of these initiatives that were really important as symbols of the uh, opportunity empowerment agenda had mixed results, right? They had mixed results because they were terminated too early, they had mixed results because Congress didn't pass them in the right function, they had mixed results because mayors didn't administer them right. I mean, you know, there, there were only so many uh, uh, housing units converted to home ownership, not very many. I remember, I read, you know, Jack was talking about all these uh, minority-owned enterprise inside public housing, and so I, 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 try, I would try to do everything he would say, right? I would thought, you know, so, so I went to this woman, uh, I had a public housing announcement. It's probably something Woodson got me to do, because the, the reason he keeps complimenting me is because I did whatever he told me to do, you know? So, um, so I, I, this, this lady comes out, and I was talking to her at this public housing, and this is kind of my Jack Kemp moment, and she says, I run a cleaning service. She lives in public housing, she runs a cleaning service. So I'd read that read you guys are trying to do uh, variety stores in public housing owned by public housing residents. So I said, great, would you like to go in a variety store? We need a variety store. Why don't you, why don't you own the variety store? She looks at me and goes, I have no idea how to run a variety store. What makes you think I can run a variety store, right? So we had a really good idea, really, ba really badly executed, right? But the idea was important and it had some effect and eventually had some legs. So, you know, I'm not, I, you know, you read these kind of stories about the, uh, Enterprise zones not kind of ma uh, maturing the way they're supposed to, or the resident ownership not really. D mm -hmm. But you know, t there is a different view, a view as a result of these initiatives. And had there been re rhetoric, you, you can't change all of these decades of failed policy without some uh, tilting at windmills. And I think the ideas that Jack put out there that he advocated had an effect on the policies that we would implement. Um, you know, in kind of a zigzag way, but I, I think differentiating between the failures and successes is a legitimate question, but, it, but answering it like that, it confuses it a little bit. It really is because, uh, like you said, there are very few Steve Goldsmith kind of mayors, mm -hmm. and, and, and there was a lot of tension between some of those mayors and Jack Kemp's policies, mm -hmm. and they couldn't publicly oppose them, but quietly they would undermine them. And, and that's the kind of thing. They would, they would undermine it. For instance, when I would take Kemp or Bill Bennett uh, on a site visit sometimes, uh, within three months, a grant was cut, uh, was, was taken from a group. And people don't realize that there was a penalty to be paid uh, sometimes for embracing uh, Kemp and, and others. And that's why what I tried to do with Jack is to try to raise some private do dollars so we can indemnify these groups. <laughs> 
uh, so that when they did come along, you, you wouldn't have that kind so of. So what you're saying them. is that a Democratic mayor would punish a oh, group yeah. that that had cooperated with. Or oh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, and Congress kept those public housing authorities as independent socialist fiefdoms. I mean, they were really mm -hmm. difficult to deal with. We did right. Just to give, remember that most most of the issues we talked about now. Well, no mayor actually had control of any of this stuff. You could advocate, you could mess around with it, right? But they went through right. those public housing authorities, and maybe you all had a better view of them than I did, but I viewed them as kind of the enemy of capitalism. No, and they Congress, are. You know? mm -hmm. In other words, if, if the more you destroy your unit, the more the contractors could replace uh, windows mm -hmm. and doors, the more money that was made, but it was hostile to the interests of the residents. When Jack came along, when residents took control uh, then, then there was a, a, a cost savings. We did a cost benefit analysis of, of resident management. So not only did it improve the quality of life, but it did so at lower cost to the government. So we were actually driving mm -hmm. down the cost. Because under the old laws, if you increase your income and reduce your costs by p preventing people from coming on the weekends and washing their cars and, and all of this, that that money was recaptured by the federal government, but under the change of law, the residents could mm -hmm. keep that. And so those are examples uh, of, of the tension that exists with local officials. Okay, in, your, uh, in this book that uh, got published at the end of um, <clears throat> uh, 92, going into the uh, transition document, HUD's accomplishments and challenges, uh, one of the things that's listed is that you did pass the National Affordable Housing Act of, of 1990, which I gather involved the whole program mm -hmm. for for mm -hmm. home ownership uh, and and some uh, tenant management. So, one, how difficult was it to get passed, and two, how difficult was it to get funded? Well, we got it passed with uh, with uh, with relative ease. I mean, it was a, it was a battle, but we got it. Getting it funded was the real problem, and that never happened. And uh, in the funding mm -hmm. process, some of the major initiatives were actually undermined and, and uh, uh, converted from an opportunity uh, agenda to more public housing welfare uh, and more income uh, uh, transfers. Uh, you know, when we talked about public housing, I think it's important to, to remember that among the, among the uh, public housing authorities that we dealt with, the most popular program at HUD was the demolition program. That's, right. That's the one they wanted the most money for. That was where you did more Pruitt Igos, blow them up, knock them down. And that was the one that the public housing uh, authorities wanted more, more, more. They wanted to demolish what they had. That says it all to me. Well, they didn't want to rebuild them? Uh, <laughs> no. They, they, they would rebuild them with something else, something different, and very often what they would do is rebuild them in a way that, that uh, uh, promoted the interests of their private developer friends uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and created it. But uh, they, frankly, they never got enough money to demolish enough because they, they had so many units they wanted demolished. It was, it, yeah. it was amazing to me because what they wanted to do was tear down. What we wanted to do was build up. The they being public housing the public authorities. Public housing, yeah. uh, you know, the, the intelligentsia, the bourgeoisie of the public housing establishment. Uh, that's and what they wanted to do. They never wanted to replace them with housing for low income people. They wanted to replace them with housing with a few low income people in it and a lot of people who are not low income. Uh, that was easier to manage. Or uh, with elderly who were easier tenants than non elderly. So just, just starting with the, uh, with, with the passage of the bill, though, um, the administration was behind it, I take it, as, as part of its program, and, mm -hmm. and who were the champions in, the, in, in Congress of passing the bill in the first place? I don't remember. Do mm -hmm. you all remember? I, just, I can't remember. I can remember some of the opponents. Yeah, I do, uh, too. Yeah. Who were the opponents? Uh, Bruce Vento of Minnesota, who mm -hmm was very much opposed to the FHA reform that was part of the uh, National Affordable Housing Act in 1990. Uh, Tom Ridge was not enthusiastic about that, uh, that proposal. I mean, for them, it was reducing the number of their people who could be homeowners, and they didn't, they didn't like that. And they had an amendment which we fought off 
so that we could get the reform we needed. Okay, so um, as I understand it, the, the bill was authorized at a billion two a year, and you got something like 351 million to fund it. Um, what was the problem with the appropriation? Well, as I remember, Ms. Mikulski was the chairman, wasn't she, at the time? Yeah. And mm -hmm. but the problem was this was the, uh, we, were, we were trying to get more money in the, the wake of the, uh, uh, the, the tax uh, problems that uh, President Bush had, and there wasn't more money. Uh, there was the, uh, uh, the, the famous uh, read my lips, no new taxes uh, 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 thing from the, uh, from the 88 campaign that set the stage. We certainly weren't interested in, in, in raising taxes, and unfortunately, the, remember, both houses were controlled by the Democratic establishment, and they didn't want to do what had to be done, which was take the money away from these failed programs, the demolition program, uh, the, uh, the, uh, all of these programs that, that weren't working, and move it to the programs that would work. And there was, that was the problem. So $350 million, uh, actually, it wasn't a bad start because we weren't equipped and there wasn't the capacity to spend uh, uh, all of the money, it, pr it probably would have been done. It was a good start for us if we could have been uh, able to use it the way we, the legislation intended. Um, let me ask you about the, the efficacy of the tenant management and, and ownership uh, uh, provisions of HOPE. There were not very many tenants who actually bought their public housing units, were there? No, they, again, they were all, all kinds of barriers. We, uh, the largest one, we, we uh, very, individual units have always been sold. I mean, mm -hmm. they're, I mean, they're individual units, but we were concerned about these large multifamily units. We wanted them to be sold to the residents as cooperative. In fact, in Washington, D.C., we had the force to hand of both HUD and everyone to, to turn over that to the residents. But there were, um, uh, th there was, there was all kinds of opposition and, and, and barriers that were, that were thrown. But if you look in Caprini Green and in Chicago today, uh, quite a few residents under the Hope Six now are owners. They partnered with a developer, recognizing that resident management, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs tend to be vo very poor bookkeepers. <laughs> and in recognition of that, residents partnered with developers who then owned and they partially owned. So in Caprini Green today, you have about 40% of those units are owned by the tenants uh, of the, you know, the townhouses that were built. So uh, it, it, it exists in, in measured way around the country. So one of your model management, uh, tenant management programs was um, Kenilworth Parkside in, in DC. Yeah. And, there, and I've read criticisms of that, that there, there was endless amounts of money poured into that to, to prop it up to the point where each unit cost like $130,000, whereas you could build a new unit for fifty to $75,000. But you see, okay, let me, let, without going into too much detail, this, this is interesting, because when the residents, uh, the money was allocated to, to renovate it, right? The residents were supposed to control the process, but what happened, the architect, who was a friend of the mayor, received 80% of the money before the unit was even, the, the plans were, were, were made. And so the residents had no control and all kinds of corruption uh, that, that the resident had no control over it. So all of the, the contractors got monies and, and, and demolitions and all of that. And then they turned around because the residents had no control and then after they said, look, it's expensive. But if the residents, if the, if the influence of the residents had been implemented, the, the residents would have had control. In fact, uh, uh, when the HUD, HUD was advised not to pay the architect uh, before the project was completed. But builders got paid 100% of the money with the development, 50% completed. <laughs> okay, uh, I just wanted to clear that up. So uh, Kemp did succeed in getting drugs out of public housing, did he? Well, he raised the awareness. Mm -hmm. he, the residents uh, did. I he, mean, he worked with the residents to do that. I believe we had some initiative where if we allowed a police officer to live there, yeah. 
they would get their place for free. Yeah, it was kind of a creative easy. idea that came from one of the trips that someone said, you know, if we had some cop cars around here, maybe this stuff would stop. Mm -hmm. So we, we were able to affect it on the margins, as I remember. But yeah. the real Cock success there was in making uh, everyone realize that the residents didn't want, that the residents wanted to be drug free. It wasn't they who brought the, who, who, who were creating this problem. It was all kinds of predators that were coming in and, 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 and upsetting uh, uh, and, and bringing these drugs into the projects. And I think we, we helped to alert law enforcement. We obviously didn't make America drug free, uh, uh, but uh, uh, we contributed to making America understand that public housing residents didn't want to be uh, uh, faced with this plague uh, and, and they wanted the projects cleaned. Yeah, a little, uh, for example, when Kimmy Gray and the residents would expel a family because the, <clears throat> the children were dealing drugs and they put them out what, and they had rigid uh, standards, what happened is that the family then became certified as homeless and the ACLU would file suit against the residents but they would then put on a priority list to come back into the same development. And so, uh, so there was this tension between uh, uh, the ACLU, because of a person's misconduct, they were rendered homeless as a result of their misconduct, but because of their condition, they were then placed in priority to come back into a public housing development. Okay, let's, uh, let's go to Enterprise Zones. So uh, Enterprise Zones legislation was proposed in, in 1989 by the administration. Um, it never passed Congress. Who, why? What happened? Do you remember, John? I don't remember. Well, I think it's, um, we talked about that in a different context. It wasn't very appealing to Democrats, and Repu it was not going to be helpful to Republicans in their districts, particularly. The places that needed uh, enterprise zones, the, the places that we identified as uh, deserving of enterprise zones, the poorest places, they were in Democratic congressional districts, by mm -hmm. and large. And, in, and also in states which, where the senators were usually, uh, usually Democratic. So there wasn't much in it for Republicans, uh, and the Democrats didn't want it uh, at all. Um, it, it, w it was tax legislation, right? It, yes. So was it ever in the Treasury budget that, uh, that there would be money for this? Mm -hmm. I don't uh, think there was. Well, you didn't need. Mu I mean, because it, or, it was going to get. Be, it was. It was. Uh, uh, how was we it were going to reduce though? taxes in the enterprise zones, and I don't remember how it was scored, but it was scored well enough to be in the to be an administration uh, proposal and and to get into the budget. That's how it got introduced. Uh, the problem was that the opposition didn't want tax incentives; they wanted cash incentives, and they kept yeah. uh, uh, trying to amend the legislation in each case to turn it into another income transfer uh, scheme. Okay, um, let's go to uh, the relations between uh, Jack Kemp and the White House and the rest of the administration. What was his relationship with George Bush like? I think it was a good, healthy relationship. Remember, they had been competitors in the 87, 88 cycle, never really crossed the line in terms of saying anything poor about each other. Um, uh, he was, I think, surprised to be asked to be in the, in the cabinet and uh, recognize that this was an opportunity which would open some new doors and be able to keep promoting his ideas and thoughts, Jack would. Um, but once he got over there, as John Weicker wisely reminded everybody, there were a lot of other priorities in the world at the time. And so with our, with our scandal problems and our reform needs, you know, we were kind of put on the back burner a little. Uh, Kemp would always go to cabinet meetings. He would usually go with something to say. He would um, about HUD, about or, HUD or sometimes he would creep <laughs> into other people's areas, which would get other people upset. I used to get regular phone calls, usually from the cabinet affairs, and the, while he was in the car back, to find out exactly what happened to be prepared for. But it wasn't it wasn't out of a disrespect for the president or the vice president or the team. It was a healthy competition of ideas, and that's really you know I, I, you asked what made Kemp. I think the football thing started his whole relationship with the world, and um, obviously his family. But he liked that that competition of ideas, and he never hesitated. And I can't tell you how many eyes-only memos we would write to the White House that would appear in columns around the town regularly because it was that's how we moved our agenda forward. And that was a, a wise way you, to do it. You leaked them? 
I didn't, but somebody did, I'm sure, in the I department. <laughs> I was proud of it. <laughs> but no, but it was, a, it was a tool at the time, back to my void, we decided to fill it. We, we thought going public with a lot of ideas was often a better way to move the agenda forward. And I think if you look backwards, it did. And did all these, you know, you're grading all these different things. Did they all pass? Did they all get funded? No, no, no. But they were intellectually stimulating to a lot of people. So if you look at mayors today, 20 some years later, they're talking about these things. They're doing these, they're implementing. That was the goal. Okay. Dick Darman. <clears throat> uh, supposedly, Jack was in endless conflict with, with Dick Darman, the, the budget director. Tell me about that. Well, I don't know that it was Darman. You know, there was an interesting thing, a phenomenon in the White House. There was a, uh, a group of young staffers. They were, they were basically, uh, remember Lee Atwater had run that campaign in, uh, in, uh, in, in 88. And he uh, p uh, filled the, white, uh, the lower levels of the White House staff with people. Uh, the, the one that comes to mind most uh, was Jim Pinkerton. Uh, but this whole little class of uh, uh, people below Darman, maybe two or three levels, and they were young, they were activists, they were conservatives, and they were left high and dry by, you know, Darmanomics uh, and the fact that, uh, uh, that, that the administration was, was, uh, uh, was, was foundering, frankly, the whole tax thing. And, and this young group, uh, Pinkerton was the, was the uh, ringleader, clearly Kemp became the hero because he was the only one in the whole administration who had a proactive agenda. Uh, he was on offense. The rest of them were down in the bunker trying to, trying to uh, figure out defense. And uh, at some time, I think it was in 1991 uh, uh, or so, Pinkerton started giving a series, a series of, of speeches that uh, uh, advocated what he called the new paradigm. And this was absolutely, I mean, it was all Kemp rhetoric, and it was built around the things that we were trying to do and clearly pointing out to other departments, if you could do it at HUD, you could do it over there. And this was really rankling uh, Dorman, and uh, he actually uh, finally uh, responded by uh, uh, giving a speech. Uh, it was an inside, you know, the administration speech, and, and his response to Pinkerton's new paradigm, which was Kemp, it was Kemp stuff, but we didn't write it and we didn't provide it, we inspired it by uh, our behavior, Bob Woodson, what he was, was doing. And uh, the most famous line of that speech I remember from Darman was, hey brother, can you uh, uh, paradigm? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, a, a parody on, uh, you know, buddy, can you spare a dime? Um, so Darman's, uh, Darman's responsibility, as he conceived it, was to keep a lid on the deficit, right? Yes. And mm -hmm. in his book, he actually says that, uh, that some of the, the, the the two big conservatives in the administration, in the cabinet, Jack Kemp and Bill Bennett, were the big spenders. Um, now, did Jack actually want to increase the HUD budget net? We always proposed re mm -hmm. uh, reallocating what was in the HUD budget. Uh, we never wavered. Uh, we never. There was no tax that we ever supported. Uh, we always said that what we have, what is being funded, is ineffective and it should be reprogrammed to other things. Your meetings with Mary and, and Scott, uh, going through the budget, looking at programs, what in here can we get rid of to put the money where we want to put it? And that isn't easy, but uh, we spent a lot of time, and I, I'm sure Mary and Scott spent more time than that trying to do it. Uh, I don't know quite how you can say we were big spenders at HUD. The budget was about $35 billion, which was not a large sum, and it didn't go up that much to and speak And you never up. asked for more? You never asked for increases was, in the net HUD budget? There were some uh, mm -hmm. items that uh, you had to have increases because there were contractual obligations that you had to honor, and they were, they were going up. This was particularly true in some of the uh, sub privately owned subsidized housing programs. A lot of the but money, some of the money that was used to promote resident came from recapturing yeah. uh, uh, funds that from a region that were unused. Uh, yeah. they, those would be recaptured and reallocated to, to other areas. Yeah. But well, the, reason this, the yeah. reason this took off is because Buchanan was running against Bush from the right. Mm -hmm. And Buchanan called Jack and the HUD team uh, big government conservatives. And that was where it really started to stick. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, Al's right. We spent most of our time trying to spend the money that was already allocated yeah. and reprogram it in a way to one of our priorities. And it was a constant struggle with OMB, because they didn't really care, and with the Hill, because they wanted it their way. 
It was a constant struggle. So, so why would Dharma not have been in favor of the reprogramming? Uh, if you were going to spend the same amount of money, but you were going to spend it differently, why would he be against that? Dharma? He would be against it because he, he believed that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the appropriators were, not, were going to ignore the reprogramming request and use it as an excuse to, to, to add more money. Uh, that, that, that's what ultimately happened. The we would say, let's reprogram. The appropriators say, no, you want to do that? We'll give you some more money. And they'd, they'd give you more money to, uh, uh, to do it and, and make the budget bigger. So was he, uh, was he fundamentally resistant to the ideas, that, the, the priorities that Jack was promoting? And well, I think to some degree, yes. And that's why I told my funny story about OMB. You know, charging the building the, the, the night, the, the morning we were going to do our deal. I mean, there was some tension there. You know, but was Dar it ongoing? Darman was a green eye shade guy in our views on how everything was going to be done. There was no real creativity coming out of him and his shop, and we thought we were going to do the opposite. Did Jack have meetings with him often? Uh, I don't remember him having many meetings with him. Uh, they would interact at the at the cabinet meetings. They would talk on the phone occasionally. There'd be a few secret memos written to him that Novak would always get. Uh, so it was, <laughs> it was part of the program. Usually Mary and I and, and Tom Humbert were sent over to, uh, uh, Peacekeepers. to uh, either make peace or uh, negotiate what, uh, what had to be done. There were one or two. Uh, uh, I mean, part of the, uh, the issue was, well, I mean, Jack was a cabinet secretary, and, so, and, and Darman, that was his rank. And uh, so generally, if Jack was going to go to the White House to meet, uh, he would want to meet with Sununu. And, uh, you know, Darman would, so. Uh, so how did Darman treat you? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> Darman, Darman was all right. He, he was a, uh, a, a gentleman. Uh, but uh, he certainly, you know, uh, recognized that uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I was, uh, you know, part of this uh, uh, conservative uh, type agenda and, 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 and different than he. He was always a gentleman. Okay. Uh, John Sununu and then uh, then Sam Skinner. How did how did Kep get along with them? Chiefs of staff. Uh, always had a, uh, probably a better relationship with Skinner. I mean, Sununu, it was a very kind of gruff chief of staff, as we all know at the time. And uh, I think there was some good, healthy tension there. Uh, usually it wasn't Sununu that would call, it would usually be Ed Rogers, one of his deputies that would call me and criticize something we may have done or something that may have been in the papers that morning. But it wasn't a big deal. I mean, it really wasn't. I mean, we were, we, we kind of, we had a plan, we knew what we wanted to do. We had a leader that was healthily engaged in what we were all trying to do, and we just did it. Yeah. So we didn't spend a lot of time worrying about if the White House personnel guy was going to call and be upset about, you know, we'd <laughs> hire some people occasionally and spread them around the building, and that was it. I remember going over to the White House with Jack one time for a meeting with Sununu and Darman. It was about the funding for the Hope Agenda, and uh, you know Darman was was giving us very little, and that's what the job of the OMB uh, director is. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sununu was was sympathetic, and we walked away with more than 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 we would have, and, and certainly uh, uh, Sununu was was uh, uh, was helpful uh, uh, on that occasion. So uh, tell me about these cabinet meetings where Jack was n not confined to the HUD agenda. I mean, what, what kind of reports did you get back about Jack's intervention in, in the business of other departments? Secretary of State, you mean? Or I remember there was an issue with an Israeli leader coming over and, and the administration, Sharon. Sharon, that's Sharon. right, and the administration was kind of giving him a bit of a stiff arm. and. Uh, Kemp had breakfast with him or something like that. That was a little out of protocol. That was probably the most high profile poof. Um, but, you know, cabinet meetings in those days were pretty scripted events. The president would have his cards and go through it, and people would have been pre-selected on asking questions and things. And, you know, Kemp would just go as a, as a former member of Congress who had been to many meetings at the White House with President Reagan. And, um, let it all hang out. I mean, it wasn't like there was a plot and a scheme of what are we going to say at the meeting next Tuesday. It was based on his emotions, what was going on in our world, what was going on in the big picture world. I mean, but at the end of the day, he never crossed the line with the president in terms of being loyal and supportive. What he was very clever at doing was using the president's words 
to remind him what the president had said and what we're trying to do over at HUD. And that was really, in my view, and I think our senior team's view, the line that we stayed on all the time. So uh, Dan Coates, um, his, his friend, <coughs> told us that, uh, that Jack reported to him one time <coughs> that Jim Baker, the Secretary of State, said to him after a cabinet meeting, Jack, you are the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. You are not the blankety-blank Secretary of Commerce. You are not the blankety-blank Secretary of the Treasury. You are not the blankety-blank Secretary of State. Did, did he? I believe I remember that happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, are there any other such events that... Uh, I don't, Al, do you remember? I don't remember them all. I no, I mean, you know, keep in mind, we weren't at the cabinet uh, no, I know, meeting. But, but we got the calls. And, and, did Jack, you know, did Jack the, report uh, back to you? Uh, the call? Jack, you know, Jack, Jack was not a negative person. You know, this is one of the things about Jack. Jack was not a complainer. Uh, he was very upbeat all the time. What, what, what you saw was what we got. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he wasn't likely to tell us about uh, every little skirmish that might have uh, uh, taken place. And he was always focused on what he wanted to get done, not what other people wanted to do to distract him. Okay. And he was also a former member of Congress. And Jack, I don't think, ever stopped being a member of Congress. Okay. That's a good point. Uh, let's let's, let's <laughs> jump point. to the uh, 1992 riots in, in Los Angeles. Um, the, the riots break out. What does Jack do? I was gone. Uh, I think he, he went, went there. out there. He went well, out well, there. He well, went there, and Bush went there. Yeah. Yes. Well, what what happened was the 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 riots broke out, and uh, the fa uh, on say a Wednesday, if I remember correctly, and then uh, uh, the White House announced that they were creating a uh, special task force. And uh, the task force was going to be co-chaired by two deputy secretaries. The deputy secretary of uh, education, who was David Carnes, uh, and uh, the deputy secretary of HUD. That was me. And uh, so we were both sent out there with a bunch of assistant secretaries to, to try and be the, uh, the response and find out what was it we could do within the resources that were available. Uh, and ultimately, we paved the way for uh, a trip. Jack uh, flew out uh, with the president on Air Force One. Uh, they, they, they toured the areas. Uh, they, they met with a lot of the, uh, uh, the folks on the ground in the communities. Uh, then I think the president went back. Jack stayed a, a little bit longer. Uh, there was the usual FEMA. There was the usual government response in a disaster. Uh, and then uh, uh, we crafted... Uh, a, something that went beyond it, which was, uh, uh, what did we call them, NOx, Neighborhood Opportunity Centers. So FEMA would come in with their usual, you know, applications for disaster relief. They used to call those disaster recovery centers. And uh, what we did was after about a month or so, when most of the disaster relief was taken care of, we created these Neighborhood Opportunity Centers, which were designed to help uh, uh, rebuild uh, over time. Um. So <clears throat> what, how was the trip set up where uh, Jack was going to go visit someplace and uh, uh, he had to, or he did enlist Jim Brown, former football player, and, uh, and John Mackey, former football player, and various gang members to help uh, protect him, I guess, against, uh, against another gang that, uh, that, that uh, Maxine Waters, the congresswoman, from Watts wanted to initiate. Do you remember this? I mean, he... You know, I, I, what I remember is Jack go... I mean, Jack had friends everywhere. Right. And, uh, you know, this was part of the NFL business line that I told you <laughs> uh, about. So that if he was going somewhere and he had friends, uh, they would set up meetings. I don't remember any gang wars. He would... He would Jack met with gang. people to find out what was going on and where, how, how to help. It wasn't a... Uh, you know, this wasn't uh, a little West Side Story, uh, uh, I, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, you tableau that we were yeah, doing. Yeah, when Jack... Uh, this is not... It wasn't associated with the riots. I, I remember when Jack was uh, chosen as the VP. And he 96? was... Yes. He was campaigning... Um, I arranged for him to be welcomed by, in Waxing Waters District, by then the, the, the person who ran the Boys and Girls Clubs, and it was a big sign with 300 
uh, black folks saying, welcome uh, Jack Kemp. And Maxine Waters sent over uh, a small group of goons to break it up, and they were met by a group of the people that I knew who discouraged them from coming, and they left without incident. And Jack had a successful Jim Brown visit. And John Mackey not involved no. in that one. So okay. another Woodson <laughs> operation <laughs> throughout my life. <laughs> okay, okay, we're we're, we're, we're almost done. Them. We're almost done here. Um, <laughs> the, this is this is now separate from HUD, but it's the HUD time. Um, Bush agrees to the 1990 budget deal, which involves breaking his pledge of no new taxes. What was Jack's reaction? I mean, Newt Gingrich went ballistic. Um, Others, other conservatives were against it, but what did Jack do, and what did Jack say, and did he go public? Well, his first reaction was if he should resign. He, he should would, resign. If he should resign. Uh -huh. And he quickly came to the conclusion, no, that would not be for the betterment of his agenda, what, what he was getting accomplished at HUD. Now, who did he discuss re resigning with, and how long did that last? Well, he got a number, as I remember, he got a number of calls from his former colleagues on the Hill. Um, I remember having a few discussions with him about it, but by the time I was discussing it with him, he had pretty much decided it wasn't the right thing for him, wasn't the right thing for what he was trying to do at HUD. He thought it politically it was a disaster, but it wasn't his disaster, and he moved on. But there was, there was, there was a lot of heat from his friends from the House, and maybe from a few in the Senate about, you know, you've got to make a statement about this. That's Al, all I remember. do you remember any of this? The only thing I remember is him saying at a staff meeting that he called the president and said, how can I help you? Okay. Uh, so then the 1990... After he decided not to yes. resign. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> the 1993 budget comes out, and he goes on some Sunday show and pronounces that it was full of gimmicks. And Mary Cannon has actually told us that Marlon Fitzwater called up and said, you, you know, turn that around, but quick. Do you remember this? No, I don't. Okay, know. and and there were news reports at the time that uh, well, that George Will and Bill Buckley were actually agitating in public that Jack should re replace Dan Quayle as the vice presidential candidate, and others were saying that uh, that that uh, that Jack ought to be named the domestic czar of the next administration. None of which happened, obviously. But um, uh, do you remember any of that? No. Uh, yeah, I, I do remember that people were always trying to manufacture mm -hmm. these controversies and these rivalries, particularly with Quail. Uh, there were a lot mm -hmm. of people uh, doing that. And I, uh, uh, you know, I always found Jack to be very uh, uh, cooperative with uh, the vice president. Yeah. And the vice president's staff was certainly very cooperative with yeah, us. Uh, and uh, Dan Consider Quayle him a was great a, friend. Uh, yeah. a, 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 a gentleman. Uh, but nevertheless, there were people who were promoting this. And Jack always uh, never said to me once anything uh, uh, derogatory about Quayle and was always uh, of, of the view that we should promote him, help him. Uh, and he always helped us. He was, he was uh, 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 frankly, he was the antidote to the Dorman problem uh, uh, over in the White House. Okay. Um, did did, uh, did uh, Jack Kemp campaign for Bush actively in 92? As I recall, he did whatever they asked him to do, yeah. uh, uh, and he was on the road a great deal of, uh, uh, of, of, of the, the, the time. Um, I don't guess, remember. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Scott was gone. I don't remember. So did, did w when Jack reflected on his HUD years, did he think that he had been a successful secretary or not? Jack always believes he's successful at whatever he does. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> no, he was. Think, of, think of what Jack, Jack was, you know, he was a professional football player. Yeah. He won some, he lost some. Mm -hmm. He didn't, he wasn't constantly rerunning yesterday, yeah. last week's game. That's that true. just wasn't, uh, wasn't him. For public mm -hmm. policy, he was all forward looking. And it was yeah. always about <laughs> the next victory. It was never about last month's defeat. Never. That's true. Okay, what, what have I not asked you that you think needs to be said about Kemp's tenure? Well, don't start with me. Start with Goldsmith, please. <laughs> I have to think well, about that. Well, thanks. <laughs> um, so, so just uh, um, 
maybe a few quick uh, comments. One with respect to your last question, I mean, when Jack would call to tell me what uh, Governor Bush should be advocating in the 2000 campaign, or he'd call John and John would call me, I mean, he was obviously, there was no reservation about the, his confidence in his policies and his enthusiasm for him. So if, you're, if your question is, they think he was successful, the definition of success is continuing to espouse important policies that were hatched in that period, then the answer is unequivocally yes, right? And in fact, um, you know, the, the other thread that goes through this is his, his irrepressible enthusiasm for those issues. W one would hope would necessarily bring him into conflict with others, even his own party, because that's, that's the nature of who he was and why he was important, right? So, so it's just kind of like the earlier issue about outside, inside manager, whatever, and Jack is who Jack was, and, and, and had he rounded off those edges, I doubt he would have been that mm -hmm. successful. I think, uh, in terms of what you've missed, I think, you know, I know you're kind of looking at the HUD period more, but, you know, these, uh, these issues are really important right now. You know, uh, Republicans and immigration, it's a really important issue. You know, appreciating diversity and opportunity, a really important issue. You know, do you, how do you address the, uh, uh, the issues in America today between haves and have-nots? Really, these are really important issues. And so I, th I think probably um, the, uh, the, 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 the legacy of the policies. I mean, you know, I don't, I don't quite share the enthusiasm of the other four guys about how easy it was to deal with HUD as a mayor trying to implement Kemp policies, right? It, got, it, it, was, it was a struggle, right? Yeah. It, it, the, 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 as the, all bureaucracies the, are. As all bureaucracies. It wasn't Jack's fault. I'm right. just saying it was just as, if so if you say, why wasn't there more of this? Why wasn't there more of that? I mean, if we could have, these, these four gentlemen and Jack and I could have gotten together and told Congress what to do to HUD, you know, it would have been easier to do. So, again, I just return to the theme that uh, a lot of heavy lifting on important policies uh, uh, permeated that and should, and should be, we should pay attention to that now. And the dilution of those policies because of some of the bureaucratic, institutional, congressional uh, issues um, eh, may be just as much a badge of honor uh, as, it is a, as it is a criticism. Well, l l let me fold the, uh, as a final question, the, uh, what I last asked you about, what I, what I haven't asked you, with the, what is the ongoing importance of Jack Kemp's example as a HUD secretary or as a politician in general for contemporary American politics? Large question. I think it starts with the basic that ideas matter. That politics is about ideas. Bob said it earlier, good policy can be good politics. And you know, I, I, I learned a tremendous amount from camp, campaigning with him, working at HUD, the experience we all worked together on was great. But you know, I've, and I've watched a lot of these department's heads and cabinet secretaries for the last 25 years. I'm here in town, I, I work with a lot of them. Either you're usually loved mm -hmm. or you're feared in this town. And Kemp had an ability to be both. He was loved by his uh, constituents around the country. They cared what we were trying to all accomplish. And he was feared by guys at the White House that didn't like it and didn't think it was part of their agenda. And he was able to use that. And no, by the way, no, not many other secretaries that I follow have been able to be loved on the outside, feared on the inside, and be able to promote your agenda altogether. And that's kind of a unique combination. And I think it was based on his upbringing, his football experience, being a mm -hmm. politician, a member of Congress, knowing how to work with people. I think the experience of running for president was a good sobering effort for him. He ran on ideas. They didn't work. He lost. He picked up his shoes and kept on going. And I think, in a way, HUD was kind of a culmination of all those experiences. Ed, do you, do you, uh, do you think he has, a, has had a lasting influence on the Republican Party? And if mm. not, what should the Republican Party be doing to? Oh, there's no doubt about it. The whole, the it. whole model of hope, growth, and opportunity that many people have run for president on, and uh, that, that, that started in the Kemp bone. And um, he would probably be having a difficult time right now in the Republican Party That's right. um, over some of the issues that are on the front burner today. But, um, you know, immigration probably being the number one. He would have been going crazy over the spending and the, the lack of growth in the economy right now. Um, and I think he'd be somebody that people would be looking to as a wise man in these troubled times right now, not just for the party, but for the country on how to get through some of these problems. 
Uh, the part of the legacy that uh, we haven't touched on uh, is the people. Uh, I wish I had Sharon uh, Zaleska's Rolodex here in front of me so I could go through those names, but just a couple of them, Ken Blackwell in Ohio, Frank Keating, went from HUD to, to go on to be governor uh, of Oklahoma, and uh, Paul Ryan is a great example. Uh, and there's scores more at other levels from county government to state government to the Congress who were inspired by Jack, interned with Jack, worked with us at HUD. Let me just say that I, I think that that there are, I, I don't see very many Steve Goldsmith, Jack Kemp Republicans today. Jack understood the importance you recruit of, of recruiting people to conservative principles based upon demonstrating that they improve the quality of life. That people on the left have a ground game. You can say what you want about George Soros and the rest, but they understand that you must demonstrate those principles in the actual lives of Jack understood that, so he had a ground game. Republicans today and conservatives, if they were running the uh, invasion of Normandy, they would have a naval bombardment and an air force, no Marines and no army. <laughs> uh, and, and Jack Kemp was a person who understood if you want to recruit people to your principles, demonstrate to them, not preach to them, but demonstrate to them that these principles have consequences. And, and Jack was willing to stand by and demonstrate the consequence of embracing these principles. That's lost today. Conservatives are more concerned about winning arguments than, than anything. I think what he, what, following up on that, uh, we hear a lot, I've heard a lot over the years about the Republican need to reach out to minority groups. Uh, Jack was doing it before anybody else exactly. was doing it and before anybody else was talking about it. Right. And uh, it was perfectly genuine. I was in meetings with him with all sorts of people, from lobbyists down to uh, public housing residents. And he got a lot more pleasure out of meeting with the public housing residents than he got out of meeting with the lobbyists. They were, some of those meetings were fun. Uh, he did have a foreign policy, and I remember uh, several meetings where some lobbyist would come in to him about some issue. And about halfway through, Jack would get on the subject of uh, freedom for Lithuania. And the lobbyist, <laughs> who didn't know a thing about Lithuania, didn't know where it was, didn't care where it was, and would have to policy <laughs> business line. Yeah, would have to be would have to be playing along. And those were great fun for all of us, except the lobbyist. And but he was he was focused on making a difference, uh, not only in America but around the world. He was a great believer in democracy and freedom, and he meant it every every day. Well, thank you very much for do, for doing this. And now we'll have a final word from Jimmy Kemp. Well, I want to thank uh, Mort Kondracki and all of our panelists uh, for a great discussion on uh, the HUD years when my father was Secretary uh, of Housing and Urban Development. Um, the mission of the Jack Kemp Foundation is to develop, engage, and recognize exceptional leaders who champion the American idea. Dad believed that the American idea was actually the human idea, um, the idea that people naturally want to be free, that they want to improve their condition and lot in life. And in a speech in 1989, in his first year, um, he wrote about the time in history uh, that everybody was experiencing with the uh, breakdown of communism. Um, and he wrote this, or spoke these words, the world is changing before our very eyes. The sweep of that change is profound in its implications for international relations, for the global marketplace, and for the welfare of your communities, your neighbors, and mine. We have seen what people can do, people determined to be free, people driven to change for the better their condition in life. The Chinese students, Hungarians, Czechoslovakians, and Polish people yearn for the same freedom and opportunity we so often take for granted. Indeed, from Asia to South Africa and from the Baltic to the Adriatic, the Iron Curtain of Communism is crumbling and the idea of democracy, justice, and equality of opportunity is rising. What we heard about today in this Kemp oral history on the HUD years is that Dad cared about people. Um, and he linked that 
to people around the world. Uh, these truths were not just truths for the inner city, but they were true for everyone. Uh, and the names that he put in this speech um, included Kimmy Gray from DC. All of these folks are uh, people who he met in the housing projects who cared about where they lived. He had Kimmy Gray from Washington, D.C., Rosa Parrish from Nashville, Irene Johnson from Chicago, Mildred Haley from Boston, Bertha Gilkey from St. Louis, Alicia Rodriguez in East Los Angeles, Laura Lawson in Atlanta. And he knew that those individuals who cared about their lot in life and those, the, lot, the lots of those neighbors around them was what drove everyone around the world to yearn for freedom and opportunity um, and he passionately believed that poverty was not a permanent state, that poverty is not a poverty of the soul or the spirit, nor is there a poverty ideas, nor of will. My dad was convinced that people have the drive and determination to overcome their economic poverty if we but offer our assistance in removing the walls and barriers to their growth, independence, and self-fulfillment. The American idea, the human idea, Dad believed, was based on the desire for freedom, the necessity for growth, and the importance and priority of family. Those three things were the bedrock of what Dad understood to be the American idea. Um, and these ideas live on in the Jack Kemp Foundation and with the recollection of uh, people like on uh, this housing symposia uh, panel, um, our effort is to carry on the legacy and ideas uh, that have such an incredible impact. They weren't dad's ideas, but they were ideas that he had an incredible ability to communicate well um, and clearly and to inspire not only our nation, but people throughout the world. So thank you all for being a part of this and uh, we look forward to what the future has to come. As dad would say, this is the most important exciting time in the history of civilization to see what is coming. Uh, thank you very much.